Hi, welcome to Speak as One. I'm Julie Coriath. Today I am just thrilled because I'm wearing clothing from our first sponsor, and that is Spring Frost, a clothing boutique here in Austin, Texas. So I wanted to thank Spring, and we will have all of her information uh, down below, and you can check it out. And today we have Juliana Mate, a directress, and Maritere Velez is an actress and screenwriter. And they are here in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest with their world premiere of their film, Without Prescription. So, hello ladies. Hi Julie, <laughs> how are you? Oh, wonderful, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yes. It's a pleasure. So I really want to go right into the movie because, you know, it's your world premiere. I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I've read up on it and I just would love to know more. Um, yeah, so would you like to uh, speak on that? <laughs> well, Without Prescription uh, is a movie about uh, this girl, Olivia, and is uh, in Puerto Rico in uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, she has a relapse with her uh, obsessive compulsive dis disorder. Sorry, uh, so she doesn't have a uh, insurance, medical insurance, and she just needs to get uh, her prescription, a prescription for her meds. Mm -hmm. So she meets this guy that can help her get them without prescription. Mm -hmm. um, but a storm leaves her trapped in his apartment. So they start uh, knowing each other and they find out that they have uh, this unexpected connection through their trauma. Hmm. Good. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like that. <laughs> yeah. And it's based on her own journey, her own experience. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. yeah, I actually started writing this movie in 2014 when I was diag a year after I was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that when I wrote the first draft, I just realized that uh, I was having this uh, condition, but I couldn't talk about it with anyone because people sometimes were a little, people don't didn't know my condition. They wanted to help me, but they didn't know how, they didn't, mm -hmm. we didn't talk about that. So mm -hmm. I tried to find like a refugee in movies, I have always, that has always been like a thing that I, I do, I try to find movies not only when I'm happy but when I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I want to see a character going through the same things that I am going right. so we can like cry together, I guess. Yeah. And I realized I have never seen a movie about OCD that wasn't like a, a comedy or very um, common traits that people usually will associate with OCD. Mm -hmm. So I told Julian, I have never seen my story. I have never seen myself identify with anything regarding this my condition, so I disappeared for a week. She was super worried because she knows that I was having a, a relapse. So uh, then I came back with my first draft and we started discussing it. That's amazing. And Thank so you. I'd like to ask you, so is OCD something that you struggled with when you're younger? Do you mind telling us a little bit about your journey? I think I started uh, having my first uh, the first time I realized that wasn't normal was when I was in college, because I have always been, uh, I have always lived in Puerto Rico, except when I went to Madrid to make my master's degree on cinema. And that's when I was al alone in my apartment and I started realizing that uh, the things that would go through my mind, I couldn't do a certain kind of things. Uh, and I, I need to do things in a certain way, and if I didn't, I wouldn't sleep, I couldn't eat. That's when I started realizing, like, this isn't, I don't think this is normal. But I was so afraid because I was like, if I tell people, they, they, they will, will just think that I'm crazy. Right. That's what my, at the moment, that was my, my thought. So mm -hmm. I didn't tell anyone, I think, like, until three years later. Uh, 2014 when I was like because it was already affecting like my job I couldn't work I couldn't leave my house I couldn't sleep I couldn't and I was like I, I have a problem and I need to admit that I have a problem and once I told my family they were so they didn't understood but they would support me mm -hmm. and I went to a psychologist and a psychiatrist and the psychologist uh, was the one who for the, the first diagnose, mm -hmm. diagnosis I had he told me, uh, you have OCD, mm -hmm. uh, 
And when he started explaining it to me, first I thought it was gonna be horrible. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, he's gonna say to me that I'm crazy. And I felt such a relief because I was like, okay, I'm just have a condition and this is treatable. This, uh, so that was very, for me, it was a, a very, it's super weird, but I felt happy because I was like, I'm sick and I can treat myself because now I know what it is. And it's, it, it's always, a, I can uh, treat it. There's always gonna be uh, different alternatives mm -hmm. to help myself, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, I think OCD is one of, you know, the terms that can be kind of thrown around a little bit, you know. Oh, I am so OCD. I yeah. Mean, oh, I, I clean a lot. I, everything is uh, in order. Like, yeah. I have OCD. Yeah. yeah. People, right. <laughs> yes, people joke a lot about that with me. That, you know, sometimes it depends on the day. I'm like, I'm not in the, today I'm not in the mood for your jokes, but sometimes people, people that usually don't even know that I have OCD, but they will be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so OCD. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I don't. No, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one specific thing that you would focus on when your OCD was at a higher, I guess, level or yes, uh, usual? Some, uh, one of the few things that I still use when I, I haven't had a, an episode uh, like in the last two years, I think. Oh, that's <laughs> no, that is awesome. Thank you. I haven't had, but I, I think that one of the things that helped me a lot was, and I can remember now exactly how my psychologist called it, he would, he would just tell me, you can, whenever you are like in a public place, because I was also a professor, he was like, oh, that's okay, you can do something that people pr probably won't notice it. Uh, you can sit down for a moment, put your hands in your thighs, mm -hmm. Uh, and just breathe and just uh, count to five, then hold it and then exhale and count to five while you exhale. Mm. And, it, and you can do that like five times and that helps me a lot. It's something so simple as breathing and counting and leaving my hands mm -hmm. uh, alone. Mm -hmm. That was for me like, and it's still something I even do, not even when OCD, when when I am like feeling stressed or I'm feeling like I can't. Uh, I can't do it. I can't. I'm. I'm so stressed. I'm so. I have anxiety. I will do that, and it usually calms me down. Yeah. Yeah. That's but I, my therapist taught me something similar. You know, it's just like put both your feet on the ground. You know, get get back in your body. You know, and and just get grounded and breathe, and try and just get back in there because it it does feel like it's such a not an out-of-body experience, but it doesn't feel, you're also not connected. Can, you don't feel connected yes. to yourself. And that's like bringing awareness, that that uh, that exercise. So yeah, it helps me a lot. As a director, um, trying to, in an audiovisual way, reflect what she was going through when she was had her crisis was very challenging because what she said was, okay, and I have this um, voice in my head, this mental loop, you call it like a mental, mental loop, loop, that is telling me that if I don't do this compulsion, <clears throat> I, am, I can't function. Like, she felt like she was going to die. And, but it's a voice that she can't hear. Mm. So how it's a voice that you can like feel, feel it because there are thoughts like they are not an actual voice. How we do you were worried that? because we didn't want it to feel mm. like a, a, a other type of condition when we you reflected on on the movie. Right. So, yeah. How how do you translate that? So um, I we we less is more. Mm -hmm. It's always for me. Mm -hmm. So um, and it is a very intimate um, piece. So. I think it was playing around with the voice. There is a voice in her head. There is a voice that we hear that is herself. But the way that we approached it um, acting-wise um, is that we worked with an acting coach. Um, and, and at the same time, she was going to therapy. So we were trying to separate um, the, Maritere, who is more of Olivia, that's the name of the character and separate that and work the voice as another character derived from Olivia but like in another place 
Um, so the work, the voice work, it's her playing a whole other character that is manipulative, that is, is trying to, you know, um, get her to do all these things. And, but we try, but the voice, we try to lose, use it as less as possible and work with a sound effect that came with the voice. Mm. So you, you can um, actually relate the sound with the voice, so we didn't have to use the voice all the time. Mm. So at the beginning of the film, she starts to hear this sound effect that we don't know yet what it is. Eventually, the voice comes in. Because um, in, the, in the movie, she has been okay for one year, mm -hmm. but Christmas comes in mm. and Christmas it can be very triggering. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yes, and just a year before on um, Christmas Eve she had a mental breakdown and uh, a whip. Uh, she also like drank a lot of pills so this is a very difficult time to her because exactly a year ago she has this emotional breakdown so uh, she started hearing this voice uh, again so she's like oh it's back. Exactly. And, oh, yeah, sorry, is that yeah. something that you experienced? Did that happen to you? Yes, um, I mean the movie, you know, uh, is not exactly like what happens to me, but uh, on Christmas I have a mental breakdown, uh, so that's when I, I think, uh, on, in, on February, I start writing the the first, mm -hmm. because Christmas has is always an emotional, the holidays are emotional, and mm -hmm. your. Uh, Seres queridos, loved yeah, ones. The loved ones. <laughs> Your loved ones are not. They are not always there. Some have died. Others are, and in the United States has to move. So, it's always an emotional uh, holiday, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I just <laughs> and also I like remember the, the emotions. Uh, yeah, and I think you portrayed in the um, in the film. Like, because your close loved ones know how to deal with you, right? Know how to be around you. But then um, the extended family, uh, they're still like walking on eggshells around you and they really, they don't know what to ask or what to say and mm -hmm. they try to treat you normally, um, but they, it ends up being like <laughs> worse. <laughs> yeah, and it's, um, I think that I was trying to remember during Christmas time, uh, I have a, a very emotional uh, break that and my I was preparing for we were preparing a party and just like an hour before I started uh, I thought I was losing my mind so uh, my family was just I was inviting a friends of mine to have like a dinner party mm -hmm. and my family was just there uh, they weren't even supposed to be at the dinner but when they saw the way I was they were just like uh, you sit down we were take care of everything. They start cooking. They start making, pre preparing my makeup. Oh, that was so nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but that, that's when I realized I was so fortunate because sometimes people will say to you like, if you don't love yourself, uh, no one will. Stuff like that. Or you need to love yourself in order to the rest of the world to love yourself. And I don't think that's true because in my case all that people, you know, I know you're supposed to do things for you, so that's mm -hmm. important for me, uh, but also I do it for everyone else because if it wasn't for them, I don't think I will even be here. Mm -hmm. and, and there is people that have loved me and believed in me, like with this movie, what I didn't love me and I didn't believe in me, and people like Juliana and my family, they loved me when I wasn't loving myself, so I, I am always, I will always feel grateful about that, so this, the movie was important for me to happen in Christmas because I remember that day that all my family just went there to help me so I could have my dinner party with my friends. And my friends came and I just, uh, after we ate, I was like, yeah, before you came, I was having a, and they were all like so supportive to me. So yeah. I think that the movie is about uh, connection and solidarity and, about and healing and, healing <laughs> and understanding yeah. that, you know, we are all going through our own emotional pain yeah. but uh, you can't fix, fix yourself in one day mm -hmm. that's what she wanted to do uh, but, but a, a day is enough for start the process of trying yeah. to you know because automa automatically what she tells me is that 
you go back to the pills. I mean, that's what you think. Like, um, eh, this yes, is what's going to fix, shut up the voice in my head right now. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the, the solution for right now, and, and that's why she focused. Yes, on. at the beginning of the movie, when she starts hearing the voices again, she automatically, she doesn't say anything to her family. She just disappears from the party and go to Sika for a friend that can help her. Uh, the, uh, her friend's boyfriends that can help her, so she's like trying to put a, a band aid in a, a wound, wound that, that is that is open. Right. So she is in denial. She just wants the pills because she wants like the momentary, uh, the the instantaneous uh, yeah. fixing for yeah, the problem. Yeah, pain to go away. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So we we didn't want it to demonize uh, meds because they are important. It, uh, at least in my journey, they helped me tr at some point. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do help me, but uh, I also needed to do a lot of things, therapy, and take some decisions in my life to improve. So Right, along with medicine, it's so important that you get outside healing. You yes. know, it's, if, if someone has cancer, they go and they get help, but then they need their doctor and they need a support group. Exactly. And so why, why don't we treat it like that? You know? Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, I think, that's what we explore mm -hmm. in the movie, because um, she goes looking for he it, it, for the so the immediate solution, mm -hmm. but then she encounters this guy, mm -hmm. who is a total asshole at the beginning, and yeah, he's he's very rude. He's very insensitive at the beginning until they start and knowing then, each other. But then she finds like this guy is broken. Like this guy also needs healing. And they start to need each other, and they start to complement each other, and just you know peel the layers and find just two human beings that are hurting a lot, and that they haven't found a, others who would actually listen to them, who would actually um, you know tell them the truth in their face without judging. And yes, because she loved her family, she loves them, but she doesn't want them to deal with her. Mm -hmm. On Christmas Day, she's thinking, I don't want them to deal with me, so I would just disappear, take the pills, and go back to them, and everything will be fine. But right. when you find a, she finds this stranger, she feels like she can actually open herself up to talk about things because he's a stranger. I probably will never see him again. That's what she thinks right. in the story at the beginning. So, well, and your family it is, you know, loving as they are. I don't know if this is your experience, but. You know, they want you to instantly get better. It's it's so hard for everyone. And if they haven't experienced mental health in that way, then they don't know that it, it takes time. Yes. yes, it takes time. And, you know, finding outside people who are like not in your circle, it's it's important, I, you know? Yes. That's, that's a lot of the reasons I'm doing this is so people, they can know that other people are have been hurting and also healing. Healing, you know. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. And in, in, in our first screening, um, there was a Q and A afterwards, and there were a lot of technical, some quest, technical questions. But the, there were people who couldn't almost ask the question because they were crying, like because they felt super so. Emotional. Yeah, oh, um, they saw themselves in the big screen, and you know, and and there were. Someone raised their hand and they, she she was like, um, you know, I have OCD and it feels if it, it felt I, I saw it in her that it felt so good to like actually openly yeah. say it and we were so it was it's not only starting the conversation but it's also making the conversation comfortable and you know normal. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it breaks the shame. Like the yeah. moment you start speaking about it. You live with this inside your head for so long and you don't really want people to know because it's embarrassing and it should not be. It's not embarrassing. <laughs> it, it is not. It, that's, but but you it just can't gotta, feel like that totally. It can. Yes. And I, I lived in that for many years. And then once I started speaking about it, it just released all that. It was like freedom. Yeah. Because there's nothing to be ashamed of. No. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you feel so alone also. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, my... Uh, my closest uh, family, they do know my OCD, but uh, my extended family and some of my friends, they don't know. So when we, the movie was about to, mm -hmm. to premiere, yeah. the producer had a conversation with yeah. me. Because we have this conversation a long time ago, so like, you know that 
this movie is gonna you're gonna be if you're gonna be vocal about it and I was like yes I want to talk about my journey so she was like but you need to you know just prepare yourself for for that so we were a little I was a little scared this this week I was like oh my god oh my god what's gonna happen uh, why did I do this <laughs> it's but been then, amazing it's been, it's it been has been great. amazing but yeah. yeah not everyone you have no idea how people will react or, of what they're gonna say because sometimes yeah. no one has been I wouldn't say people has been unsensitive to me but they do have been like oh, oh yeah I have that too you know I clean a lot and uh-huh. that kind of you know that I'm like I don't blame people I mean they that's what they really genuinely think is OCD mm-hmm. but also sometimes like I'm not in the mood for t- start explaining everyone mm-hmm. what it is <laughs> yeah. so and also I think it's important to say that for this film we didn't use your original compulsion yes we we, we changed, changed the compulsion so that she can also because she was acting mm-hmm. the role and yes. that's a way to also like protect separate myself and protect and separate. It. It's, yes yes mm-hmm. it was better <laughs> it was the best choice and what's the compulsion on on film on, on the movie um she she needs to uh, wash her mouth constantly and um the character it It's very subtle. It's it's there that in, in the past, mm-hmm. she washed. Um, a, she was obsessed with a, her gums, her gums and her, and her teeth, and having teeth. everything so 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 clean that she basically destroyed her mouth, her teeth. And these are new teeth. Uh, like th- in, they're in comics. The like oh, you look too. great with your new teeth. Um, in the so in you, the you start realizing with a, a little piece of information like oh she she this used she, to be really bad. Uh huh. It's starting over again, and it could be, get as bad as that. So that's why she's desperately looking for help before it gets to that point again. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And she in, in the movie she doesn't have health care, right? She doesn't she have doesn't have health care. <clears throat> that happens to me when I was diagnosed. I didn't have uh, insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I was in the process of uh, getting insurance, but it was very difficult. Like mm-hmm. this is the worst time in my life to get to to be without insurance because I just turned 26. And that's like in Puerto Rico after 26 year, uh, yeah. You can't be I, your parents. Um, I can't be on my mom's uh, insurance, so I will have to. I mean, I could, but it's going to be so expensive. So I, I, I needed to get a new one, and that's when one of the major inspirations for the movie that because it's not that accessible to people. Right, it's not. And and with my even with the insurance that I have, uh, was very difficult. It was very very difficult. I think that even for um. For a few months, uh, the first when I was really like uh, severe with the condition, I didn't have insurance, and I I started having insurance, but it didn't cover my psychologist, so I need to pay that work extra hours, so I can pay for the psychologist, so I can uh, mm-hmm. heal. So that yeah. was very difficult. We didn't want to make the movie about uh, like criticizing the healthcare system, but just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, there, it is it is very challenging for people to find therapists and doctors without insurance, and then you add insurance, and it makes it even more challenging. We just don't have enough help out there. Yes. Yeah. Can we talk about Jessica? Oh, of the course. character, because uh-huh. I think um, there's Olivia and there's Dani, the two main characters, but there's also uh, other characters. We wanted to do uh, different perspectives on how you um, deal with your mental journey, mm-hmm. and um, there is this other character who is like the opposite spectrum in in the opposite spectrum of Olivia, because Olivia doesn't want to be a burden for her family. She doesn't want to talk about this with anyone she wants to deal with it herself she doesn't want to ask for help and that's yeah. what really and that's her it. problem mm-hmm. um and mainly she needed to get something out of her system it happens at the end i don't want spoilers mm-hmm. but part of her healing journey is accepting something that she what she was kind of covering up from her past a trauma from childhood but um then the opposite is that the character jessica They met in a mental institute, and um, which is based also in your experience. Maybe you can tell yes, later. Yes, a friend. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, and Jessica, it's like all about talking about it. She's all about being super vocal. 
about yeah she's like the total opposite of, of Olivia and we love Jessica people love it when they see the movie but she can be too Jessica much also because she can be like no let's chill let, let, let's let's <laughs> everyone just share our journeys <laughs> and she would just talk about Olivia's condition in front of other people and Olivia that infuriates her like you don't talk about that in front of right. other people so but she has so good intentions like she genuinely she meant she means well when she uh talks about this but she's uh, we wanted to show like different people and how they deal with their pain mm -hmm. especially these three characters like Olivia David that is the, the co-protagonist mm -hmm. and Jessica that is uh, his ex-girlfriend mm -hmm. but we wanted to show how they deal with it Olivia is like no no I'm fine I'm fine I'm just need a pill and I'm gonna be fine mm -hmm. Uh, Jessica is like, let's all share our stories, and David will be all like, uh, David is like, I'm okay. Like, what mental I'm health? Okay. What? I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that, that's a made up. Story. Yeah, you go to us like, what? what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they are so different. We're good. We're okay. We're fine. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so, yeah. as her friend, how how was it directing her? And have have y'all done this before? Yeah, we yes. we work together. Um, in another feature and three short films before so we had a, a like a professional relationship of six seven years already or eight years seven eight, seven or eight years eight years 2013 uh -huh. i think and we started like, as colleagues you know she it's basically the same format that um she writes her very personal stories and acts them and i and i direct them um and we hadn't touched about upon the mental health issue yet, even though it's a huge part of her, of her journey, because it, she was still finding herself, you know, find, mm -hmm. dealing with it. And I did um, in the in the first movies, uh, you know, it was just about getting to know each other as professionals, and then eventually we became like sisters, and you know, um, started to know more about each other. And I was I, I was part of her breakdown and her, her crisis. I remember that at one point, you had you were driving. Um, que se te congeló el cerebro. Uh, yeah, I was driving it was, and uh, it was yeah. a very weird experience. I felt like I was dying. I was so sure that I was gonna die while I was driving. And mm -hmm. I, I remember I called my sister and I explained that to her. Like yeah. I think I'm gonna die. Yeah. And she just keep, kept, keep, kept talking until I uh, arrived home and she was mm -hmm. there waiting for me. My mom, she kept, my mom, everyone was waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that happened, if I remember well, after one of our um, rehearsals for the first movie. For the first movie, yes. We were doing mm -hmm. an exercise. We were doing an exercise from, because I use a little bit of um, the actors, mm -hmm. a real stories with real people from their past to do improvisations mm -hmm. mix it all like just to um, try to find common so ground emotion, with, emotions with and the characters and, and common ground yes so, so, yeah. yeah and then so she had just seen in front of her one of like one of the things um uh, that happened in her in her real life mm -hmm. uh, with her friends in her past and then I think this happened right after that, and I felt a little bit um, guilty, guilty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because oh, she, because like, she had no idea, and I didn't have idea. I didn't know, so that yeah. it was just like uh, all these memories and all this that just I was feeling a lot at the same time. All these memories and pains that I usually have lived for a specific moment, but I was, I felt like I was living many painful memories that happened through many years and I was feeling them all at the same time when I saw them and that mm -hmm. was too much for me and the, and my OCD that has to do with my hearing, the hearing, so the voice is different but it's also connected because it's with the, the audition and my ears. So I remember feeling like I just want this to stop so I would just, you know, if I end it, now it's gonna be better. That was, I was very sure about that but there's always this little voice that is like, no, call your sister. That's mm -hmm. the the person who wanted to help you. And your sister so, had to pick you up, right? No, or I, I arrived okay. at, at my home and she was waiting for me, and everyone was okay. waiting. At the next day, they all take uh, they all take me to the. I went to the psychologist, and they were all there with me. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's I remember that. Then what, that's when I we, we first started talking about this, and yeah. months later, I will I I wrote that. Mm -hmm. She never said anything to me about you need to write this down. She was always very protective with me about you know you do what you but that it was my idea I came with a screenplay and I was like 
yeah, I, I think yeah. we, we should talk about this. So and we became ever closer friends closer, after yeah. that. Yeah, and the, and also and the process of um, the development of the film, it took a very long time because finding the funding mm -hmm. for uh, an independent feature with actors that are not known mm -hmm. in a in a country where uh, you know in an island where um, local cinema uh, filmmaking is the structure is not yet um, the funding structure is not there yet so so we went to a lot of you know labs and and festivals to polish the, the, the screenplay. screenplay and it was I think it was very also part of your healing process to to in those in those forums mm -hmm. talk about it as well mm -hmm. uh, and when we were pitching the idea to other filmmakers and they we had feedback that was the whole idea right to polish uh, with their feedback um, it, it was interesting the reactions um, And it was also like a little um, rehearsal of what we were experiencing right now, um, because uh, the, the, it, like at the beginning of the pitch, like our pitch started like, okay, so I, I, I've just been diagnosed with OCD, and I wrote this story, and I'm gonna act it. And, because I've never seen any any movie. That and you saw everyone yeah. in the room like, oh. Okay. <laughs> Is she going me. to? <laughs> yes, I remember we, in, on the lab with Ibermedia, we won the fund for for the lab, and I remember telling people like I have OCD, and they were all like, they were all so nice, but they were like, all right after that at the lunch, like, are you, are you okay? okay? What you <laughs> we were watching movies, and they would be like, oh my god, this is gonna be triggering, like yeah. triggering. Mm -hmm. We were watching like movies that were about dramas, or mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm fine, don't worry, yeah. you are not. I'm fine. I can see movies. You know, if I am don't, not feeling well, I will uh, tell someone and yeah. I will leave the, yeah. the the room. But I remember it was <laughs> people meant well. Yeah. It was it was kind of funny. And, and then during uh, the filming of the movie, it was 12 days only, which is like an insanely small amount of days to shoot a feature. How long were your days? 12 uh, hours. <laughs> yeah, hour, and we like, didn't go over time. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So in those 12 hours, she's in every scene. In those 12 hours, she had like at least five moments where she was reacting mm -hmm. stuff that happened to her or moments that she had feelings, emotions. And then, and, and we did something at some points in the film where she had an earpiece um, and I was acting the voice. Like I was reading or telling her stuff and it got very very intense where we we did talk about this before like okay it is going to be very intense you will have to be um acting your i mean not necessarily your compulsion but but these very intense emotions we i need to know when you need to stop and take a break um and do some breathing the breathing exercises and just be there for you And we did that whenever it's too much, and it was not a big deal. It was like, oh, the the uh, she's she's going, she's breaking, she's yeah, breaking. Yeah, she was yeah. not like that. And everyone in the in the crew knew it. So, um, it, like it was like, okay, we need a break. Like everyone, take five. Let's drink some coffee, and we're just gonna do I our think, breathing thing. Yeah, I think that's so important for everyone. You know, I just you get in these situations or work or whatever, and you feel this intense amount of pressure. And whether it's preventative, you know, so you don't get to a point where you're about right. to break down or, or you have had, you know, struggled with mental health issues or whatever, and now you have to make sure you take care of that. Either way, take, take five, you know, yeah. yes. take five yes. and just breathe and go yeah. be outside in nature and then come back. And then, of course, people are going to be rejuvenated and want to work harder. Exactly. Yes.